Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting the channel via PayPal or Patreon. You'll find the links in the video description. So here's the game between Fabiano Caruana and Temur Rajabov from round seven of the candidates. Um, uh, just spoiler alert, if you want to know what happened in Rapport against Nippon Nishi, then do check out that video which I've recorded and posted. So, um, okay, here goes. So, Caruana, half a point behind uh, Nepo going into this round, had White against Rajabov, who's not having a great tournament. So, clearly, you know, he wanted to have a go. And he was probably very pleased to see a Sicilian on the board, so he's going to get a, a, a good fight here instead of e5 and and then you have to work hard to get an advantage knight f3 and now a6 well this is really an unusual move at this level uh, the point is this this is the so-called o'kelly variation if white now goes for an open sicilian then black is fine here because you get in e5 and this is not like a knight off because there's no pawn on d6. The bishop can come to b4 and, you know, for example, here, and bishop b4 and black is already level in this position. Very, very much like the Kalashnikov, actually. <laughs> More on that in a second. So it's well known here that white should either play c3 or c4, and Caruana goes for c4, which, you know, you can argue makes this pawn move a6 look a little bit ridiculous um, it's not that clear I mean black can go into a hedgehog kind of position here so Rajabov played knight c6 and d4 now you go into this open Sicilian except we've got a Marozzi bind and you know black can play with d6 and knight f6 and g6 if you want to but Rajabov plays e5, and this is like a delayed Kalashnikov. Um, remember, a Kalashnikov is like this. There you go, e5 in this position, which actually cuts down white's options. But let's come back to this position. The problem with e5 here is that white can play knight f5 in this position. You can't do that in the normal Kalashnikov, because after knight f5, black equalizes very easily with d5, and you get this position here. Takes, um, well, I mean, this, this is even dangerous for white because the king is still in the middle of the board. It's actually better to play queen takes here. And basically, well, black has very easy development. Um, white has to be careful to just get a quality here. It's equal, but black has zero problems after knight f5 and d5. But compare with this position after e5, white can play knight f5. Now, if black has to sort of compromise and play d6, then, well, white has a very pleasant advantage here with... You know, this knight is extremely well placed on e3, um, covering d5. And here, this is a game Carlsen against Artemyev uh, from one of the uh, online tournaments in 2020. And this is just a lovely initiative for white. But after knight f5, Rajabov played d5. So still trying to break out in that way I mentioned earlier in the, in the Kalashnikov. But this isn't as successful because after takes, well, black certainly doesn't reach an end game. Looks quite active, looks quite nice, but remember black has given up this light squared bishop. And here's an important moment, knight c3. Black has got the pawn back, but white is gaining a lot of time against the queen. You know, that's very nice. And you have this light square bishop. So queen takes g2 actually loses straight away or gives white a winning initiative after queen a4 check. That's a good move because the point being that if b5 you can actually just take that 
So if knight takes, you throw in a check and then take the rook. And of course, pawn takes allows queen takes rook check. So it's not possible for black to take on g2. So the queen has to go back and castle. So you can see that material is level, but white has an advantage in development, but also this beautiful light squared bishop. And that, as we'll see, is a very important piece in this game. Now, what happens if knight takes? Well, not great. Again, it's about development. White brings the queen in, attacks here, and yeah, just has a wonderful lead in development. That's very dubious for black. So knight f6, bishop g5, nice development, and rook e1. And it's tricky for black to hold on to that pawn. You know, maybe the simplest thing to do is just castle kingside um, and, and hope to try to hang on in this position with the knight on d4. It's a good piece, but white is obviously better here. But Rajabov played castles queenside. I mean, frankly, I find it uh, difficult to understand why he went in for this variation. Because white's moves aren't too difficult to find. And basically, you know, white is now a pawn up. So the game went like this, knight takes, no, knight c6 rather, and the king's a little bit exposed. You know, it takes a bit of time to shuffle into the corner. Bishop takes, bishop takes, and rook d5. So that solves the problem of what to do about that bishop here. And it's clear that white is better. This is an extra pawn, and f7 is also a little bit vulnerable sometimes. Then again, looking at it from Black's viewpoint, this bishop is a very strong piece. And there are opposite colour bishops, which does give Black some hope in end games. And here, well, actually, Caruana plays inaccurately. He played queen d3. Should just play g3. I mean, g3 feels like a very normal move. You give the king an escape square, a light square, of course. Uh, that pawn takes away some, some squares here. White is just a bit better there. But queen d3, and here, well, there's there's a nice move. Um, black would like to play knight e5 here. Obviously, that looks nice. But then queen g3 is quite an annoying pin. But instead, if black plays queen c7, preparing knight e5, obviously closing that diagonal. And black has decent play here. You can see that, that those exchanges have kind of transformed the position a little bit. You know, these pieces are all really active. The knight covers d5. And it's difficult for white to kind of hold everything together if only that rook were in play. But it's basically, you know, one tempo decides what's going on here. Um, but Rajabov instead played queen b4 instead of queen c7. And queen c7, not an obvious move. I mean, that's a computer move. Um, but certainly, you know, black would, would have decent counterplay. Queen b4 is also interesting. The knight goes back. White is, is better here. But here, Rajabov played rook c8. Um, and b5 is an interesting move. Basic idea is this. You give up that f pawn okay white is you could say a clear pawn up now because the the double pawns have been removed but black has a lot of play it's it's that bishop on f6 which is absolutely key and if white plays rook d1 you can take king comes out you know it takes a little bit of time for the king to get in the game opposite color bishops give black Real drawing chances here, particularly when that bishop is so strong. Not easy to convert that one. When said Rajabov played bishop, uh, rook c8, bishop came back to d3. And here, well, Fabi has the advantage again. That bishop anchored in the middle of the board. That's very important. And now the king comes out. This is very nice. The rook comes back, looking to play the knight into d5. 
bishop takes, therefore that is eliminated. So now there is, there is a weak pawn here, but somehow that's quite a gain for white that this bishop has left the board. And so we now have uh, this bishop against the knight. Yeah, that pawn is a bit weak, but watch what happens on the king side. This is really interesting. Okay, for the moment, Caruana just compromises. He had spent quite a lot of time here. And it, it can't have been an easy situation for him because he would have seen what was happening in the game between Rapport and Nepomnishi. Nepo basically had a beautiful initiative from very early on. Do check out that video if you want to see it. Uh, you'll find out what happens. In fact, Caruana said after the game that he was felt a bit sick watching what was going on in Rapport against Nepomnishi because from very early on, Nepo had a kind of dream position with black. Now, this is really nice. Once f6 is played, then there is a huge hole on g6, and that's where the king is heading. So this is a lovely maneuver. So, sorry, let me just backtrack a moment. Why did black play f6? Well, this is actually a very annoying move in a lot of variations to break up these pawns and then you know a rook can come round either on, on the back rank or perhaps d6. Yeah, in this case, could, could be d6 in some positions. Uh, and once those pawns are split, then, you know, that's uncomfortable. So that's why f6 was played. But it does allow the king into the game, and this is key to the situation. Uh, Caravan are running short of time here. And, you know, the position starts to get very, very complicated here. Where Rajabov now has counterplay on the queen side. And this is, it's very hard to calculate. Um, you know, there were some inaccuracies around here. You know, for example, here, King g6 immediately might have been better. But anyway, let's see what happens in the game because it's absolutely fascinating. So uh, Rajabov has got his pawn back. In fact, now he's a pawn up, but the king has reached this fantastic position. And if this one can be taken, then this will be taken, then the f pawn is ready to roll. Now, here Rajabov played knight c3. Let's just have a quick look at b4. This is fascinating. Watch this. b3, this pawn is pushed. King takes. b2, rook takes, rook takes. And rook b3 cleans up just in time. And the rook cannot get to b7 because that square is covered by the bishop. We're going to see in subsequent variations that that bishop plays such an enormous role in the game, such an important role controlling black's pieces. And here is the first instance that why the bishop is such a good long range piece covering b7. And that wins. Take the pawn and then the f pawn rolls. So rook d7, knight c3. Now that knight covers these squares, so that makes life a bit more difficult for, for the bishop. But you could flip it round and say, well, that bishop is actually controlling these knight squares as well. But it's now difficult if that bishop wants to get back to, to stop this pawn. That's the only problem. But let's have a look. Anyway, Caruana bashed on. That was the 40th move. He must have been relieved to get to this position because it's becoming extremely sharp where it's just turning into a race now. And he had to calculate very deeply at this moment. Pawn threatens to roll through. Rook d2 stops the pawn. And then it'll be white's turn to move and push. And now pawn number two comes into play. King e6. Well, this one is actually pretty fast. And, and now it's significant that you know this knight can't come back to the king side because it's it's dominated by well not just the bishop by by the other pieces as well 
Rook takes, check, the king comes up, and f6. So we've got a race on our hands, and both sides queen. And black even queens first, so this is really scary. And queen g6 check. Caruana said, you know, he was calculating this position way back, way back when he actually played rook d2 to stop this pawn. And realized that he was okay here. Um, he looked at king e7 in this position. First, he wanted to play this, but wasn't quite sure what to do against king b5. So this king kind of sneaking out. Um, he looked at g4, but just thought, okay, this is sort of getting this. This could get out of control very easily. And that's why instead of king e7, he preferred queen f6. He thought this was a safer option, and, and it is. If queens are exchanged, well, again, we've got a race on our hands. Now, this is a, such an interesting variation because this pawn looks very strong. This knight's covering d5, so the bishop can't get back. But watch what happens. f5. Pawn pushes. Rook d2. The rook gives itself up for this pawn, and then king g6, and this one is going to roll through. The rook is going to have to give itself up for this pawn. If only that knight could get back, but watch what happens. Knight b4. Well, first of all, those squares are covered by the bishop. Okay, what happens if the knight tries to get back this way to e5? Nope. Bishop e2. What an incredible piece. What power. Ranging across the board, and here that pin is decisive. The rook will have to give itself up. Well, it's, it's completely over for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and yes, in this position, if the, if, the, if the rook just gives itself up for the pawn, then white will clean up here. The king is too close. That The black king is too far away. So queen f6 just played. Queen e8 check. King d6. I mean, it's unbelievable how deeply... Well, both players calculated, but now it's it's not, yeah, it's it's not possible to to make the king incredibly. It looks like one of my mate in two positions that I like solving. But this king doesn't have a move. You know, you need need to be able to check the king here. Um, Caruana said he was very happy to find rook c seven. And this kind of starts to simplify a little bit. If rook takes, then this is decisive. Caruana said he thought knight e4 was perhaps the most tenacious move, forcing this exchange, and then they're through into a queen and pawn endgame. Should be winning for white, but queen and pawn endgames are notoriously tricky. So he thought he was in for a long haul. But instead, after rook c7, it went king b5. And now he was able to exchange queens, I'm sure, with enormous relief. Because that just makes life much, much easier. And you can see that knight still dominated by the bishop. And here, well, rooks were exchanged. If check, then king e7, it doesn't help. So rook takes, king takes, king c5, and now the, the pawn just goes through. Rajabov just collapsed, basically. e7, and that was the final move. If knight d6, the bishop can just come back to control the a-pawn, and now that's completely lost. Uh, you can just make a queen. Well, it's actually took to in this position. Um, the king is going to have to leave the defense of the knight, and, and these pawns just run out of steam. Yeah, completely lost. I have to say, I think that's an incredibly well-played game by Fabiano Caruana. You can always quibble about you know, certain inaccuracies, um, but overall, I thought his, his ambition and his technique 
and his bravery in going in for these really sharp positions where, where there's a race here. You know, optically, this looks like Black could be winning. But Caruana had judged this absolutely correctly and realised that, in fact, White is still the one with the chances here. Well, not just chances, probably objectively winning. That win, so that meant that Caruana kept pace with uh, Nipomnishi. So we have, after seven rounds, the halfway point in the tournament, we have uh, Jan Nipomnishi with five and a half out of seven. Fabiano Caruana, five out of seven, and they are clearly in the lead. Third place, Hikaru Nakamura, with three and a half, a point and a half behind Caruana. So it really is turning into a two-horse race, but both players look like they are on excellent form. Uh, by the way, one more thing. <laughs> I just, um, I mentioned the Kalashnikov earlier. My chessable Kalashnikov course is actually on sale at the moment. Do check that out. A chance to get it for a bargain price. So do check out. You can find the uh, link to that in the video description. And the book has just been published as well, so do check that out too. I'm looking forward to round eight, and it is turning into another classic candidates tournament. Thanks for watching.